Welcome to our voter forum for ballot measure 86. The forum will last approximately 40 minutes and will cover ballot measure 86, allowing the legislature to sell bonds to create a scholarship endowment for Oregonians pursuing post-secondary education. I'm your moderator, Debbie Kay, with the League of Women Voters of Portland. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that works to help citizens make informed choices in elections. We do not endorse any candidate or political party. Rather, we give voters information they need to be informed voters. Membership information is available on our website and at the table at the back of the room. We thank the Multnomah Bar Foundation, Neil Kelly Design, and Paloma Clothing for their generous contributions to our education fund, making these forums possible. Today's forum is being recorded by our media partner, Portland Community Media. All forums will be available for on-demand viewing from a link on our website, lwvpdx.org. To view the forums on local access cable TV, see the playback schedule on the table at the back of this room and post it again on our website. Voters can also look at our nonpartisan voters guide for answers to questions posed to all candidates as well as nonpartisan presentations of the ballot measures. The Voter's Guide is on our information table in print form and also on our website, lwvpdx.org. You will also find free copies of Multnomah County Library branches and the Multnomah County Elections Office. Another important voter resource is housed at the Secretary of State's website. It is called OrStar and enables you to see the financial sources for campaigns. In other words, to follow the money. Type O-R-E-S-T-A-R into your browser. And finally, to see information about the candidates and ballot measures that will appear on your ballot, go to vote411.org, enter your street address, and the Voter's Guide information for only those items on your ballot will appear. Ballots will be mailed beginning today, so look for yours very soon. And now to our forum. To discuss Measure 86, we are joined today by Oregon Treasurer Ted Wheeler, advocating for the passage of Measure 86, and Steve Buckstein, founder of the Cascade Policy Institute, arguing against it. Our forum will consist of opening statements followed by different types of questions, then closing statements. For each round of questions, I will rotate the respondents so that the same speaker is not always the first to answer. Questions directed to one side will be given two-minute responses with a one-minute rebuttal for the opposing side. For questions that apply equally to both sides, respondents will have 75 seconds to present their answers. Members of the audience are invited to pose questions. Please write them legibly on cards that are available from James Offsink. Timekeepers, thank you very much. Sitting in the first row, we'll signal a 15-second warning and then stop when the speaker's time has expired, and we have a little bell just in case we need it. <laughs> Before my questions, and beginning with Treasurer Wheeler, each speaker will have seven minutes for opening statements to explain their position. Please go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having us here today to be able to explain both sides of ballot measure 86. Uh, I always enjoy speaking with Steve on this subject. And uh, collectively, I think we're proud of the fact that we've debated ballot measure 86 more times than you've had to hear either your candidates for the United States Senate or a governor <laughs> debate. So we feel that this is being fairly vetted. Ballot measure 86 is a simple and responsible strategy that helps Oregonians to be able to afford Oregon universities and community colleges. It reduces student debt and it increases funding for vocational and technical training programs. I get asked, well, Ted, why do we need ballot measure 86? The reason is this, national studies confirm what Oregon employers have been telling us for years, namely that in a global, competitive, skills-based economy, advanced education and job training are more important than ever. We know that people who attend college earn far more over the course of their career than people who don't. The gap is huge and it's growing. With that in mind, it's disappointing to understand that the state of Oregon, when it comes to connecting middle class and lower income folks, 
to that education and those skills that employers are telling us are so important, the fact is that in the state of Oregon, we're moving in the wrong direction. Consider this, for the last generation, the state legislature has reduced financial support for higher education in the state of Oregon. As a result, we're near the bottom of the list when it comes to per capita support for higher education. In fact, we're 47th. So even though the cost of educating students in our institutions of higher education has remained relatively stable over that time, who pays that cost has shifted dramatically. Most notably, as the legislature has defunded higher education, the burden has shift away, shifted away from the taxpayers at large onto the backs of students and their families. That shift has not been without consequence. The price that students and their families pay for higher education in the state of Oregon has gone up by 50% over a recent eight year period. Well, we have student financial aid, right? That's what other states have to help middle class and lower income folks gain access to that education. What about Oregon? We've also defunded student financial aid in the state of Oregon. So we're not only a high price state when it comes to gaining access to that very necessary education, we're a low student aid state. We are so low, in fact, that our student financial aid is about one third the national average. It's one seventh on a per capita basis what the top state, South Carolina, provides to their students. It's so anemic, in fact, that for every five students who apply and qualify for student financial aid in the state of Oregon, qualify based on need, only one out of those five students gets anything. And because the funding is so variable, getting it one year does not guarantee that you get it the next year. This reality combines to basically shut far too many middle class and lower income Oregonians out of higher education in our state. They either take on more student debt, the average Oregon student now graduates with about $24,000 in debt, or worse yet, they opt out altogether. If only one out of five qualify, I ask you, what happens to the other four and why should you care? When it comes to vocational and technical job training, I'm sorry to report that the situation is even worse. This state many years ago started down a path that I would describe as penny wise and pound foolish where we effectively gutted vocational and technical training programs in our state's public high schools. Ballot measure 86 acknowledges that not everybody wants or needs to go to college or do a university, but all people in our state need access to the skills and training that employers are telling us are so important in a globally competitive skills-based economy. Ballot Measure 86 helps provide those skills. It does it in a very simple format. It provides the legislature options that they don't have today. That's what Ballot Measure 86 does. It provides them proven, responsible financial tools that they do not have access without a vote of the people. Most notably, it gives them the ability to create an endowment, a permanent growing endowment. That's a fancy way of saying a fund, a diversified fund, just like the many other funds that the state treasury currently manages, just like the endowments that Harvard or Stanford or MIT have for their students, but we're gonna have it for ours. Why do they have endowments? because they want to take advantage of compound earnings growth over a period of many years. We're a resource constrained state. So it makes sense that we would look for tools other than tax dollars to fund higher education. An endowment allows us to take advantage of compound earnings. That's not a tax. It also, the way we structured 86, ballot measure 86, it allows us to accept philanthropic contributions from civically minded institutions and individuals. So that's another way we can leverage it. And when we're talking about vocational and technical job training, we're talking about building partnerships between community colleges, high schools, and private sector employers, many of whom are willing to share some of the costs of those partnerships. So again, we're leveraging partnerships. I encourage you 
As you think about ballot measure 86, ask yourself, why are so many employer organizations like the Oregon Business Association, the Portland Business Alliance, labor organizations like the American Federation of Teachers, SEIU and AFSCME, universities like Oregon State and the University of Oregon, community colleges like Portland Community College, and a whole host of community organizations, including the Oregon PTA, the Portland City Club and others, endorsing this ballot measure. They're doing it because it turns around all those different lists that we're on the bottom of and allows us to help our people gain access to education and training. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Buxtein, you also have seven minutes to present your position. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak here today. Um, as Ted mentioned, my alma mater, Oregon State University, is supporting this measure, I'm sorry to say. But I did earn a bachelor's in physics and an MBA from Oregon State. I've had a keen interest in public, advancing public policies that help Oregonians get the education that they want and need. Uh, part, that's partly the reason that I helped found Cascade Policy Institute in 1991. We're a public policy research organization or a think tank. We're nonpartisan and nonprofit. You can see all of our work at cascadepolicy.org, including some written material on this measure if you're interested. As an opponent of Measure 86, I was appointed to the explanatory committee by Secretary of State Kate Brown, two opponents, two proponents, and a neutral fifth party to write the objective ballot statement, explanatory statement that you'll find in your voters' pamphlet. I think Ted and I agree um, that that ballot, that that explanatory statement explains what Measure 86 says, but we disagree as to whether it's good public policy, and I have several reasons, and I'll go through them quickly here to hopefully stick to my time. First, the measure is silent about which, if any, students might benefit from any funds from Measure 86. It doesn't say that it has to be based on need or that it has to be based on merit. It doesn't say whether it'll be grants, whether it'll be scholarships, whether it'll be the pay it forward concept that's been talked about. And it doesn't say who will make those decisions. That will be left up to some unnamed public body. Uh, it might be the, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, but we don't know. Whatever body is chosen by the legislature, whatever body makes those decisions will be subject to the same lobbying efforts that the legislature is subject to now. And as Ted points out, you know, we've quote unquote disinvested in higher education. Um, from a crass standpoint, it's because the lobbyists for other programs have been more effective at making their case to the legislature. And nothing in Measure 86 says that that will change. Second, if, if Measure 86 does help some students in the short run, I argue that it'll make the, the system more expensive in the long run. Ted and I disagree about the economics on this, but I think um, whenever you have someone else paying the bill, it tends to raise the cost. And even President Obama in 2012, uh, when he advocated expanding Pell Grants, federal Pell Grants, wanted the condition on it that, that it was tied to colleges holding down costs because, as he said, we can't just keep on subsidizing skyrocketing tuition, unquote. It's a recognition on his part, and I think a lot of economists' part, that, that when you put more tax money into something, not intentionally, but it makes it easier for the institutions to simply raise the price. So it may help some students in the short run, but make the whole system less affordable in the long run. And if we want to make the system more affordable, Measure 86 is silent on how to do that, on how to reduce costs. And I think Ted himself made, in my mind, one of the best cases for how to reduce costs in higher education. So I want to quote him from a, a talk that he gave about a year ago. He, when asked whether the money in Measure 86 would be used uh, effectively, he said, quote, about the university system. He said, it's very slow to adapt the opportunities around technology. He said, there's a lot of institutional inertia in the university system, just as there is in Salem. And all these new technologies have opened up new windows to learning that do not require a student to even be in the same state. He then pulled out his cell phone, it might be this one, smartphone, Very like this, and basically said he has a program on his phone called iTunes University, which lets him listen to some of the lectures from some of the best academics in the world. It doesn't cost him a cent. It can be a, what he called a, a game changer. And quote, it threatens to undermine, not threatens, it, it will, I believe, undercut the entire economic model of the university system as it currently exists today. I hope that's true. I think it is true. I think we can make college more affordable, but Measure 86, if it's passed and if the legislature issues bonds, as this would allow them to do, 
it will lock taxpayers into paying those bonds back for 30 years to pay for a high cost system that may become a lot lower in the near future. So why are we saddling taxpayers to do that under Measure 86? And if you didn't realize that taxpayers would be paying off the bonds, you're not alone. I think a lot of legislators, I was confused initially when Ted first brought the idea up several years ago, uh, I think a lot of us thought that, that the, the state would borrow money, the earnings would pay off the bonds and pay subsidies to students, but that isn't the case. All of the bond payments come from the general fund, which is basically all of us, income taxpayers, personal and, and business income taxpayers, will pay off the bonds and only the earnings on the fund will go to, to subsidies. Finally, we have a bigger problem that I think we need to focus on. Um, three reports came out recently based on SAT scores. Only 46% of Oregon high school graduates are college ready. Only 30% of ACT college admissions test takers in Oregon are considered college ready in all four subjects that were tested. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce just issued a report for all 50 states. For Oregon, they found Oregon was one of the very worst states when it comes to preparing students for college and the workforce. We earned a D in academic achievement, the letter D like a grade, and an F in post-secondary and workforce readiness. So before we encourage more spending on higher education, I think we should find ways for our public school system to prepare most college-bound students to actually succeed there. Otherwise, we're just paying twice for the remedial courses in college to teach them what they should have learned in high school. We pay for high school through the, through the, the K through 12 public school system. This will be paying for college for some students, unfortunately, who aren't ready to be there because they didn't get what they needed in high school. So I think we need to find ways to make college cheaper more than we need to find ways to spend more money to make it affordable, the high cost affordable for some students. So I urge you to vote no on Measure 86. Thank you. Thank you. We will have uh, the ensuing question section allowing each representative to ask a question of the opposing side. And uh, the respondents will have two minutes to answer. Mr. Buckstein, would you like to go first? What question would you like Treasurer Wheeler to okay. answer? Okay. Um, Ted, um, and I haven't actually asked you this before, so I'm not sure what your answer is, but um, <laughs> I'm concerned that under Measure 86, if it passes, the legislature can take the will of the voters and say, okay, we're going to do the will of the voters. We're going to borrow $100 million, let's say, invest it in the, in the fund. The bond payments of, say, five, six million dollars a year, which taxpayers will pay, can be offset by other money that they would have given to higher education to the system. So they get credit for doing what the voters want under Measure 86 by issuing those bonds and spending, say, five million dollars on bond payments. But they could then turn around and reduce uh, the amount of money they would have given to higher education sort of quietly. And I'm wondering if you're concerned about that, the fungibility question about the money. Um, thank you for the question, and, and it is a provocative one. In all of our modeling around ballot measure 86, and you know, not, not to bore you with, how long do I get to respond? Minutes. Okay, so I'm not going to bore you with the details because I can't, but I'll just jump to the chase. Uh, using real numbers, if we'd invested through this type of program 30 years ago, if we'd issued $100 million in bonds, let's say, got the actual returns we've got in our portfolio for 30 years, you know, five recessionary cycles, a global economic meltdown, a dot-com bust, uh, a real estate collapse, if we'd gotten those actual returns and we'd issued bonds basically at the same price that we could issue bonds today, so using real numbers or as close to real numbers as we can get, our $100 million would have led to an endowment today worth nearly half a billion dollars. It would have spun off $350 million in addition, additional student financial aid for an eight to one return. If you use bonds, it would have been about a four to one return. Still pretty good. We assumed in our modeling that the legislature would, in fact, eventually defund the current aid that goes into the Student Opportunity Grant Program. We didn't assume it would happen immediately, but most of our modeling 10, 15 years out, depending upon what's going on in that endowment, we actually assume that that will happen. I want to make the case in my last 20 seconds that that's a good thing. What we're trying to do here, since higher education never makes the list of priorities in any given legislative session, 
for a variety of reasons. Let's take it out of the competition. Let's create a completely separate source of funding so that student financial aid and vocational and technical training has its own source of funding and it's not in that direct competition head to head with K through 12. It opens the doors for more resources for K through 12 and other things that the legislature clearly thinks are higher priorities and gives us a separate source of funding for student financial aid. Thank you. Treasurer Lou Wheeler, what question would you like to pose to Mr. Buckstein? Well, you know, I, I think Steve does a good job of, of articulating his own questions and answers, but I'll, I'll give a philosophical one that maybe gets at the difference between where we're coming from on this issue. I, I think we want to land in the same place, but clearly we have different philosophies with regard to student funding. My question for Steve is this. Um, he has said previously that he's concerned about this because it takes the responsibility off the backs of students and puts it onto taxpayers generally. That's the way it used to be done in the state of Oregon. Education was seen as a public good. If people were educated, it was good for all of us to live in a robust, vibrant economy where people are economically self-sufficient. So my question for you, Steve, is uh, do you agree that education is a public good and therefore that there's a responsibility for all of us to help pay for it. Thank you. Um, again, without boring you with a lot of the economic theory, I do believe that um, in effect K through 12 education is a public good. In other words, all of us want our neighbors to be able to read, write, do arithmetic, be productive members of society. But higher education in, in what economists call a public good, I don't think so. Because when you look at the economic analysis, and we've actually had economists do this, and again, it gets very boring and technical, but the economic benefits of a higher education, of a two-year, four-year technical degree, inures primarily to the student. In other words, the student gets the most value. All the rest of us benefit, too. But we can also benefit from people who don't get college educations. Just look at some of the most successful people in the country that are provided, like Ted's iPhone, Steve Jobs, dropped out of college, you know, died too young it's with $7 billion in the bank because all of us wanted to buy his products. We don't need to fund, as a society, higher education to the extent that I think Ted wants us to. I think we tend to encourage people to do things they wouldn't do otherwise by making, by making it too easy. Uh, we have state goals in this state to get 40% of our adults to four-year degree, 40% to two-year and uh, the other 20% to college or career ready high school diploma. But that doesn't mean that we should be pushing people to do what they maybe wouldn't want to do otherwise. They're very productive fields. People can go in that don't need degrees. I'm a big believer that competence in, is more important than credentials. And so I guess the answer is I don't think we should be looking to put more tax dollars into higher education. Thank you. I'm going to go to um, a league question, and it will start with Mr. Buckstein. You'll have two minutes to respond, and then um, Treasurer Wheeler, you'll have a moment to a minute to for rebuttal. You should tell me a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to that. Mr. Buckstein, this measure gives the legislature additional options when planning for higher education funding without obligating them to use those options. Don't we need to be empowering our elected officials with tools to fix our educational system? The problem, I think, is, and this gets into something else that Ted has talked about before, is that, as he points out, leadership is being able to manage multiple um, priorities at the same time. Uh, he argues in a previous debate that we can both fund higher education better under Measure 86 and fix K through 12 at the same time. I think that's very difficult for 90 legislators to do. Giving them more options like this, again, I think will create more opportunities for them to be lobbied, um, to basically come up with collective decisions that I think will be, on balance, will be mistakes. So I think they already have the tools. They can already invest in higher education if they want to without using bonding capacity that historically in Oregon has only been for capital projects. We build roads, bridges, even university buildings, long-term assets with bonding, um, which I think is a much better approach than opening up their option to student aid like this in a way that really even more politicizes who gets the money and how they get it. Thank you. 
I think the way you frame the question actually answers the question itself. Uh, it gives the legislature options that they don't currently have. Uh, come on, folks, let's, let's just look at the facts. Higher education, particularly around access and affordability for middle class and lower income students to not just universities and community colleges, but also job training. Ballot Measure 86 is also about job training for people who don't want to go to a university or community college or don't need to. But we have 25 years of data that show us that the tools we used to use and that my generation benefited from when it came to our access to education, those tools are no longer working. We need modern, relevant tools that'll help government work in the 21st century and this is one way to do it. In a resource-constrained state, let's take advantage of compound earnings, philanthropic contributions, and leverage partnerships. It's a totally new way of thinking, but that doesn't make it the wrong way. Thank you. And now a question to you, Treasurer Wheeler. Why is higher education different in kind than K-12 education? If at the most basic level this proposal creates a sustainable funding source for education, why are we choosing post-secondary education over primary education? There, there is no particular reason except this. Uh, ballot Measure 86 came out of a larger discussion around student financial aid. As state treasurer, I am the administrator of the Oregon College Savings Plan. And in my personal estimation, it doesn't reach nearly enough students. It certainly doesn't reach a lot of lower income students. It doesn't reach nearly enough middle class students. And so we started talking about different ways that we could re-energize access and affordability for Oregons to the education and job training that they need. That's not to say that K through 12 isn't really important. It's as important and frankly, maybe more important. Uh, but that doesn't mean we should take our eye off the ball when it comes to advanced education and training because we know that's a critical element to economic competitiveness in this global economy. So uh, as Steve said, I believe we need to do both. Uh, but to do both in a resource constrained state, that means we need a new recipe to get it done. And Ballot Measure 86 doesn't solve all of the problems around education. It solves narrow problems around access and affordability to higher education and job training. So it's a piece of a larger puzzle, but the whole puzzle is still important. I would prioritize K through 12 over higher education to the extent that uh, we prioritize higher education. Again, we should be focusing on how to reduce the cost, uh, which Measure 86 doesn't do. In terms of K through 12, one of Ted's roles as state treasurer is to be on the state lands board. Which, which basically does have an endowment of the common school funds lands, which in the last year, I think it was, the Elliott State Forest lost actually $3 million, was a negative return. I would much rather that he and the other members of the land board, the governor and the secretary of state, focus on solving that problem so that we're not costing the, the, the K-12 through schools money before we look at new quote unquote tools for the legislature to deal with higher education. Thank you. I'm taking an audience question now and um, beginning with Mr. Buckstein. What role will the for-profit career and technical schools play if this bill is passed? I believe that uh, the, the measure allows uh, for subsidies of one form or another to Oregon students in um, public schools or for-profit or non-profit private schools. So they would be in the, the mix along with uh, the, the, the public higher education system. And Treasurer Willier, do you have anything to add uh, to that? Small clarification. Um, you know, getting to the question of how is the aid distributed, that's determined by the legislature and the Oregon Student Aid uh, Commission, which actually is responsible for the Opportunity Grant Program. Uh, Steve's right, Ballot Measure 86 does not speak to that. We leave that to the education and the student aid experts. Ballot Measure 86 is about a funding vehicle. But I want to just clarify, it's for public universities, public community colleges, and nonprofit private institutions. So think of, of Reed College and uh, similar institutions. Currently under the Oregon Opportunity Grant Program, for-profit institutions are not eligible. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience. Starting with Treasurer Wheeler, what is the relationship between the program and federal financial aid? 
There is no linkage between ballot measure 86 and what's going on at the federal level with regard to Pell Grants. The only connection is that the way that the grants are distributed in Oregon today, the eligibility requirements for the so-called Oregon Opportunity Grants are based on the federal Pell Grant qualification requirements. Uh, but again, that's the legislature's prerogative. They could change that. They're actually looking at reforms to the student aid program that would increase uh, support for science, technology, engineering, and math degrees. They're looking at increasing uh, the accountability in the student aid program. But today, the only connection between Oregon's state program and the federal program is we have very similar qualification requirements based on financial need. Thank you. Mr. Buckstein, you want to add anything to that? I think Ted's correct. I agree with him. Um, one clarification, I think, if I can go back one question. Uh, even though the current aid program in Oregon uh, does not include for-profit private colleges, uh, I don't see any prohibition in Measure 86 to doing that if, if uh, whoever is in charge of the program wanted to. Is that correct? Th that is correct. The ballot measure 86 is a fundraise. It's a set of tools for fundraising. It does not speak to the distribution of aid. We leave that to the experts uh, in terms of how the aid is actually distributed, and it gives the legislature the opportunity to change and reform that over the years. Thank you. Um, I think this starts with you, Treasurer Wheeler. Can you explain why the Secretary of State determined that there is no financial impact from the measure, even when the uh, bonds will have to be repaid through the general fund? Yeah, fair, fair question. It's a good one, whoever asked it. Uh, full disclosure, um, there is a committee that is chaired by the Secretary of State that determines the fiscal impact of all ballot measures. I sit on that committee. I recused myself for this particular vote, uh, but the committee uh, concluded that there is no fiscal impact. It's a correct conclusion because ballot measure 86, if you vote for it, what you're voting for is giving the legislature legal access to proven financial tools that they do not have access to without a vote of the people. That's all you're voting for. You're not directing them to use those tools. You're not directing them to incur costs. You're not directing them to spend money. And you're not authorizing the issuance of any bonds. The legislature would still have to prioritize issuance of bonds, creating endowment, any expenditures in the context of a legislative session. This would have to rise high enough in its list of priorities to get funding. But voting for the ballot measure itself has no fiscal impact. I agree on the macro level that for the whole state budget there's no fiscal impact. But on the micro level, it has to have a fiscal impact. For example, if the legislature allocates, say, $20 million to the fund or borrows $100 million and spends a few million dollars a year to pay it back, that money is not new money. It comes out of other programs. So while there's no overall fiscal impact, if they take that, say, $20 million and give it to this fund, that's $20 million that may not be available for something you want to spend on, say, K through 12 or social services or corrections or whatever else the legislature could, could have done with the money. So there is a fiscal impact on some other programs, it's just the net fiscal impact is zero. Uh, if, may I, that's not right. Um, to push back <laughs> Jim, okay, Steve sure. and I are friends. Sure. Um, on this particular one, uh, I, I think he's, he's misunderstanding it. Ballot Measure 86 is non-directive. It does not require any reaction from the legislature, and therefore it has no fiscal impact. Now let's not be silly about this. Uh, the long list of proponents of Ballot Measure 86 expect that the legislature will act, but it's not required to, and therefore that's why it does not have a fiscal impact. But I, I debated a legislator on this measure last night, just <laughs> for the clarification, and she said they take, the legislature takes very seriously what we the voters say. So if you approve Measure 86, um, there will be, in my view, in reality, a fiscal impact on some other programs. We just don't know what they are. Fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll agree to that. <laughs> and I'll agree to yours. <laughs> so nice to have friendly debaters. <laughs> you should see us in the hallway. Okay. <laughs> I will, as, as we are looking at the clock and approaching the end time for this particular forum, I want to invite you to offer your closing remarks. And um, 
Mr. Buckstein, we'll begin with you. Okay, just to summarize a couple things, I want to make sure that voters know that Measure 86, if it passes and if bonds are issued, which is really the big change in this, that's why it's a constitutional amendment to allow the legislature to issue bonds, those bonds will have to be paid back probably over 30 years by taxpayers, not by earnings on the bonds. I don't think we should be paying twice for the public education that students should have gotten in high school. I think we need to address that first before we help enable people to go to uh, high cost, higher education where, where there's really too much being spent right now on remedial education because they didn't get what they should have gotten in high school. Uh, again, as Ted points out, um, oftentimes leadership is about balancing multiple priorities. I don't think, frankly, the legislature and some of the leaders in Salem have done a very good job mul balancing multiple priorities. We've seen a number of um, uh, real problems with state major projects recently. I think they should focus on core issues and decide what's more important. And I think K through 12 is more important than higher ed, than, than measure 86, I should say, at this point. And so I would put a much higher priority on, on finding ways to get college student, to get high school students ready for college instead of finding ways to put more tax money into a high cost higher education system. So I urge voters to vote no on Measure 86 and then let's get on with um, fixing education in Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. Treasurer Wheeler. Uh, I, I would just say in a gentle rebuttal that Fixing our primary education system is clearly the top priority for the state of Oregon, but it shouldn't be an excuse to do nothing else. There are other things that are also important in this state, and we know from you know, everything that we know tells us that access to higher education and vocational and technical job training is critical to this skills-based economy, and Ballot Measure 86 recognizes that. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the bonding capacity. If bonds are issued, if bonds are issued in association with Ballot Measure 86, they still have to be done underneath the existing bonding capacity that's available to the legislature. Nobody's ever proposed otherwise. When we proposed this three years ago, interest rates were effectively zero. Interest rates are higher now. Uh, and eventually they will be high enough that it makes no sense to issue bonds in accordance with Ballot Measure 86, but it still makes sense to create the endowment and accept philanthropic contributions and take advantage of compound earnings. I hope you'll join a whole litany of supporters and news organizations, uh, the Register Guard, the Portland Tribune, the Mail Medford Tribune, the East Oregonian, uh, the Daily Historian, and many others in endorsing this ballot measure. There have been many good ideas on how to fund student financial aid. There are people in this room representing the Pay It Forward program. Uh, there are others who are looking at uh, the first two years of higher education free, and there's other proposals that will come before the, the legislature. This is the only proposal that speaks to funding. And as the Register Guard said, if you vote for this, this sends a strong signal to the legislature that Oregonians support higher education, they support long-term thinking, and they support investing instead of just spending. Vote for Ballot Measure 86. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Almost done. This concludes the Measure 86 portion of today's forum. We thank each of our speakers for participating and we thank our volunteers at the front table and also our timers. Please check our website, lwvpdx.org, to view all of our for forums on demand and for replay dates, times, and channels for local access cable. Pick up the voter's guide here in your local public library online. Look at vote411.org for a preview of your personal ballot. Election day is November 4th. As in all Oregon elections, it is mail-in exclusively. You should receive your ballot in the next few days. They must be delivered, excuse me, they must be mailed early, which is to say, I recommend Halloween, it's easy to remember. Or hand-delivered by eight o'clock on Tuesday, November 4th. Postmarks do not count. I'm Debbie Kay for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you so much for watching. Please be an informed voter, and remember, your vote counts. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.